Yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. Welcome and thanks for coming. I'm Nancy Hobel Heinrich Knowledge Motifs LLC, and this is uh, Carl Benedict. In case if you don't know Carl from University of New Mexico, as my uh, co-presenter and co-PI on or PI rather on the uh, IMLS grant enhancing the data management training clearinghouse, which is uh, related work to, to what this presentation is. So what we're uh, what we hope to to do with this session is to inform hi come on in to inform you all of what we've been doing in terms of uh, the landscape of establishing skills and competencies for for data uh, specialists, data skills and competencies requirements for data specialists. And uh, part of what we, once we do the presentation and talk with you about what kinds of things we, we're, we've been doing, we'd really would like to have a lot of discussion and feedback about this approach and the approaches that that uh, others are doing. So, um, if so, loosen your tongues and <laughs> be ready to join in if you if you have thoughts. So the the goals and objectives. We'll, in terms of the outline, we'll talk about goals and objectives for the session. We'll introduce you to a, a skills and capabilities or competencies approach, um, and talk also about a, a, a different perspective of assessing capabilities with data life cycles in uh, stages in mind, uh, from the point of view of the research object. And we'll talk more about what that means uh, in. Uh, in, in a little while. And then the, we, your feedback would be requested in addition to the discussion from a survey form that we've got at the, at the very end. Uh, so basically what we are interested in doing is to help identify the core knowledge, skills, and competencies required or desirable for data specialists from an earth science point of view. Uh, and part of the impetus for this, the motivation for it, was uh, to create, to assist in creating an American Geosciences Institute career compass, what they call a career compass for data stewards. What you, the picture you see there is of a, and the link, uh, is to a career compass for data scientists that AGI has created. And uh, Aaron actually, Aaron Robinson noticed, or heard about this being uh, created and published maybe a year and a half or so ago and thought, you know, data scientists are nice. It, it's good to have that kind of perspective but it would also be useful to, to have a perspective for people who are interested in going into the careers of data stewards. So that's that's a little uh, that's part of what you know happens with the, happens in the ESIP community as well. What people do in the ESIP community as well. So she asked us to to start thinking about it and, and doing it. And then all of this work will inform the assessment work that we're uh, also doing with this IMLS grant that I referenced uh, for the learning resources in the data management training clearinghouse, just to give a pers to try to find a perspective of what kinds of skills and competencies people would, would need to have or to acquire as a kind of a framework in a way for the kinds of resources that we either want to find and put into the clearinghouse, or to uh, to create to, to encourage the in, the uh, community to develop. And, so, and this and this was actually quite reinforced during um, our breakout session at the summer ESIP uh, meeting, uh, focused on the assessment activity of the data management training clearinghouse. As it was immediately clear in our conversations about, especially some of the higher levels of, of assessment towards. Um, the uh, what what constituted successful learning in the context of providing training. If you're going to talk about what was learned, you have to first know what your objectives are in terms of what your what your target skills or knowledge or abilities are. So being able to identify these um, direct directly relate to some of those higher levels of um, instruction assessment that is directly feeding into the assessment work that we're doing as a part of the clearinghouse. Do people know what we mean when we talk about the clearinghouse? Do I need to give a background there? Everyone knows? Okay. Oh, yes, you have. You really? Oh, <laughs> Do you, oh really? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the elevator speech. Um, it's, a, it's a registry of information about learning resources that we've been gathering uh, uh, on research data management and data, man and data skill building. So it started in, it was launched in 16, it's a web, web portal essentially, uh, launched in 2016 with the uh, cooperation of USGS, Data One, and, uh, and ESIP. 
He's up, uh, with 65 resources to start with, and now we're at uh, almost 400. So it's a curated way of collecting, and then and we're using a metadata scheme that's schema endorsed by schema.org to make these resources available more or more broadly. And, and as I say, it's curated. So good enough. Are we are we at the top floor yet? <laughs> In the elevator? Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> I can talk to you a lot more about that later if you want. So. Um, so I just want to, to go further down into the into the process that we're looking at for this particular session. What we what we're interested in doing specifically is looking at what others have done, in ter especially the Earth, uh, sorry, European Open Science Cloud has had a project uh, for a couple of years that it, it, part of what they were trying to do was to develop skills and capabilities for data. Uh, data specialists, and so they've come out with a report. The, the you'll see this. Uh, reference or citation here that has the the the, pro, the uh, pr report there that you can go to if you want to what we've done is to take uh, take those skills and capabilities for different types of pers people or personas in a way um, and map them uh, against what, what they were doing again is map them against different areas of responsibility so so the first thing that we did with this was to have an interactive poster last last uh summer it was summer <laughs> uh, where we, we put up and you can't see this there's a link to it if you want to or the, it, we've actually i've got it in a spreadsheet form if you don't want to look at the dots but what we did was to come up with a subset of of the competencies and areas of responsibility and then ask people to give us their assessment on a range of uh, competency ranging from not applicable to high, basically, uh, low, medium, high, and put dots on which ones they thought were important for what we call data advisors and data service providers, because those were the categories that the EOSC uh, project had used. So that was a very interesting uh, experiment. This is the form, this is a poster uh, results in, in spreadsheet form, which you can go to if you want to. I think I put the link in there. Hope so. If not, I can give it to you. Uh, but one of the things that we learned is that there that uh, people had a, a confusion, or there was sorry, put it this way, it was difficult for people to think about data competency, data skills and competencies using that uh, categorization of advisors versus service providers. And part of what we're trying to do with this, of course, is within the earth science environment. So the EOSC report had a, it was a very broad spectrum of all kinds of domains and disciplines. So it's it pretty generic and also very detailed. Uh, but what we what people had uh, trouble understanding is you know what the differences were between them so i what we wanted to do today because we also want to augment you know what we learned from that uh is to talk a little bit more about what people what these folks meant when they talk about data advisors and data service providers uh, and this, the other thing that came up as, as an issue quite often for people at the poster last year was that in so many of env environments in our communities, you know, th there's no division between advisors and service providers. You know, one person in a, in a data center or a library may do all, any number of these things. So at which, or you were, or they work with, you know, fuller research teams that ha divide up the, the responsibilities differently. So it was very, it was difficult to think about how to divide them up. So, um, it, in some ways, it's an artificial uh, way of looking at this, and, and the other way that we've been looking at it is artificial as well. But I, the whole idea is to just kind of think in, in, a, in a kind of a brainstorming way about what the skills and competencies would, might be. And part of the goal for this, pro, for what we're doing, what the EOSC project is doing, and so on, is to see if we can somehow come up with a almost a framework for what what would be really important for people to learn if they wanted to go into this this you know this field basically and what what are the kind of cri critical principles uh, and and competencies that people would need that we could that could be shared so that educational resources could be could be shared could be open uh, in the generic sense of what's necessary for data skill building but then also find opportunities for providing and developing resources for different domains so we thought it would be very useful to you know give a perspective on what EOSC the EOSC report had come up with from uh, both a generic point of view and also from neuroscience point of view. So that's that's kind of the motivation for doing it, in addition to the AGI 
uh, career compass. So this is what the uh, EOSC report had, uh, has done in terms of who works on what in t from the data advisor point of view and the data service provider's point of view. So as you can see, the data steward uh, is considered an advisor, the research manager, the ethics and uh, licensing folks, and communication and IP folks, that's, that's licensing there. Uh, so public relations, ethics and public relations, communication. On the data service provider side is the data librarian, uh, the software engineers, the surface engineers, the architects and the archivist. So it's pretty, uh, it's, it's a little bit more clear about you know, who would be doing what in this environment and that's how you can see you know what what they've done in 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 terms of breaking out those competencies and and categorizing them. So um, some of the key tasks that also gives people a better idea not only of what these different folks might be doing, but also the differences between them is, are these tasks that they uh, talk about, and they also give a lot more detail about it. If you're interested in this, it's very interesting to see how they actually delineate what goes out goes on, on underneath these kind of, sort of broad categories of tasks so it's a it's an excellent report and well worth reading if you're interested in doing that um, so just to, to to contrast a data service provider data librarian is responsible for using or developing and, and also i should say the eosc report is definitely written from a fair data perspective uh, you know what kinds of competencies competencies and skills do you need to make data fair data fair so that's you know for what it, for whatever that's worth that's that's the terminology that's being used here so uh, just to give to, to give you that background so from a data librarian point of view uh, use or develop the research tools or services apply policies you'll notice that um, the policies are, are probably more done by the data stewards itself because they are doing the planning for the stewardship and sharing they, the, the data uh, steward is also using or developing research tools, which makes sense. They might be more of the uh, using, whereas the you know, data library might be more involved in, in developing, but you know, they're both, that, that illustrates the research, the, the team part of, uh, you know, of, of, making, uh, of managing data. But again, the data librarian is preparing and documenting data and code to make the outputs fair uh, whereas the steward is preparing and documenting as well. Uh, the data librarian is developing the open research strategy and vision, and the data steward is doing more of the publishing of the outputs on recommended repositories. So, so the, again, from the point of view of this report, there, uh, the data librarian is considered to be an institutional level librarian, so it's a pretty, you know, high, higher level, bigger organization, it, whereas the data steward is 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 also, uh, you know, at a fairly high level. It's operational. They consider it operational, but it's working with a research group or or department or faculty. So just to give you more of an idea. I didn't give a link to the report. I. I gave a, a citation to the report, so if so, yes, that would be. Let me see. It's right here. It's. Um, can you see this? And Annex B skills tables of. It's called Strategy for Sustainable Development of Skills and Capabilities. There is a, a, a URL in there, but it's not highlighted. Can you see that here? EOSC pilot. Just do do eospilot.eu uh, slash content skills and capabilities. Or you can look for uh, that that author as well, Dub White. Yeah. Sorry, I should have. I mean, it's included, but it's not linked. And nobody has a slide, so you couldn't do it anyway. So sorry. Okay. Oops, I'm doing it again. Okay, good question. <laughs> Get you all up to speed. Okay, so the other thing we wanted to, we were doing then, we've been doing, go away, is um, to further test this based on what we found and, and, and the problems we came up that we found were uh, involved in the interactive poster. And that is to set up a, a small group assessment of the competencies according the competencies from the EOSC report more fully 
instead of a subset, but also using the point of view of uh, the different stages of a data life cycle. And we chose data one's data life cycle because, you know, some people knew a lot about it and or had some, something to do with developing it. And, you know, it's a, it's a nice clear one we've seen uh, before. So that is the basis of, why is it doing that? Da, da, da. There. Uh, is is the, the basis of the work that we can also, I can we can show you and we can talk about a little bit before. So I think it's important to talk a little bit more about what we really mean by uh, the point of view of the research object itself, because uh, it's, it's an interesting tool to help us think about not only life cycles, the stages of life cycle, but also from the point of view of uh, contrasting the point of view of the people who are managing it, the you know the the research object avatar as as you, if if you will, so it allows us to look at the the competencies and the skills from the data perspective rather than from the perspective of the you know the person who would be doing it. What what do I as a research object need at my different stages of the life cycle? What do I need when I'm when I'm being created? When I'm about to to uh, be I'm pulled out and used in different environments when I'm, you know, the, when I'm being normalized or harmonized with different, uh, in, in the project, I'm trying to solve problems uh, that my PI has, you know, my creator sort of has um, thought I could, I could help solve and when I want to be published. So it's, it's an artificial way of looking at it, but it's been an interesting way to really pr provide a perspective. Uh, and, and we can talk about more about that as we go through what we've done. We can, we can, you can see how that might work and what the issues would be. And then the other thing we found we needed to do as we started doing it, this was to really scope it. Uh, we we needed to think focus on the the most important and relevant steps of the life cycle by judging you know what the highest impact on impact was on the research object itself given the level of activity. So that's a lot of words, and we can. I, uh, I can show you what we mean by that. So here's an example. I hope you can see this. Yeah, pretty well. So one of the areas of responsibility is uh, for research data management is to capture and process data. The different activities, the, the, the subcategory for this particular cap capture and process is to reuse data. The purpose of it is to reuse data from existing sources. This, the steps below in the, you know, in this column are to manage databases, to uh, prototype software, to set up and document workflows, et cetera. You can see what those are. So what we were trying to do was to look at, for instance, manage databases and think about it, you know, I as a research object, uh, when, when is it most important for me, for somebody, for me to be managed uh, as a database during these different stages of the life cycle? <clears throat> so we thought, well, it's important during the collect phase because you need to know what you're doing. You, know, you need to know, um, people need to know where I would fit in a database, how I would, you know, how I would uh, be kind of contained and managed and, and used for processing. It would also be important during the assure process, which is more sort of a, a quality, quality step. Uh, and it would be useful during the stages of integrate integration, because I might be, as a research object, I might need to fit within a broader scope of um, other databases, uh, within a database itself, et cetera. You get that idea. So that's an example. And if you're initially confused. Uh... <laughs> Join the crowd. <laughs> by this uh, sort of data object centric um, perspective that we're attempting to work within here. Um, yes, you're not alone. Um, it, it took us, I think, I think probably a, quite a while in multiple sessions to start our, to wrap our own brains around this different way of approaching it, but it remains helpful for us as we have shifted over to this data lifecycle um, uh, perspective in terms of being able to gain an understanding of what are the critical um, competencies that we need to be able to have 
on hand for uh, for the success for a data object to be successfully managed at these different points in the life cycle. And so we're looking at a different intersection of what are the points at which we could potentially lose a data object or reduce the value of a data object. And by taking this data object perspective, um, we're able to um, say, okay, if we lack this competency, um, we may we may not have the capacity to do uh, you know the assure step. Um, and as and and if that's identified as a critical um, capacity that's needed to essentially enable the the ultimate. Um, the uh, viability of that data object throughout the data lifecycle that highlights an, another critical competency that is needed. Um, and we need to think about how to be able to build that competency. Um, those are all agnostic uh, roles that would be in, like the lifecycle has specific roles individually. So maybe at, at plan, you don't need the, you know, the end user. Like Right, right, right. Which, right. Is, which is why we're looking at it from the citation. They are. They are. Yes, you are. You are absolutely correct. And actually, if we were to open the spreadsheet, um, you would see that there are some additional columns past the comments um, that actually that are not yet completed. That actually do bring the um, the the personas. The, the actors into the mix. And in some respects, we're also sort of looking at the intersection of that, that persona focused view that we, that we iterate, that we used in the first iteration last summer in terms of trying to identify the skills for those different roles versus now with a data object centric perspective, these are the things that we need essentially for the viability of data objects and ideally, and this is sort of coming right now. <laughs> um, it, we're, we're ultimately going to need to look at the intersection of those as how well do we cover a set of requirements coming out of a data centric perspective with a set of skills that may be embodied in different uh, participants in the, in the life cycle because that is increasingly divided amongst participants. Um, they're not performed by a single individual. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, but part right, and part of what we were trying to do is to Well, I guess our people got removed from this version of it. Yeah, well, I yeah, I, I hid it because I wanted to be able to see. If you go to the thing itself, there's also there are, there are columns some for columns, data yeah. for data advisors and data service providers. So that it shows up again in the full thing. I just, for, for purposes of dis displaying and trying to understand what we're doing, because we're not looking at data advisors, we're not looking at the persona perspective right now. We will do this, as, as Carl said, we'll do that in the next step. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the other thing I guess that's um, that's interesting about this, per this perspective of using the research object point of view is we found ourselves thinking, okay, so, you know, manage databases. You need that all the all, don't you need that all the way through? I mean, we there there were arguments for including it in the plan phase and the and the collect phase and the assure phase. And of course, you always have to describe databases and blah blah blah. And so, you know, it was it it, it turned it turned out to be more. That's why we started looking at it in terms of the the impact, the, the highest impact uh, on the research object itself during different stages. So. It's more important for to manage databases during the, you know, we we thought during the collect phase, the assure phase, and the integrate phase. Well, unless you have people online, there are people online. Okay, so I, I should be moving forward then. So in the cells, are are those weights of just like just or? yes or no at this oh, okay. point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then on the in the comments on the side, you know, we. We our discussions. Um, we had to document our discussions a lot of times so we could go back and remember what what we were what we were doing because they're you know they're very nuanced. So it's it's an interesting process and um, and, and as we were actually reusing 
this set of competencies that came out of a different process, um, it has become clear to us as we've been going through these group discussions over a series of weeks um, that some of these uh, competencies are more or less um, useful <laughs> when we're working in this sort of data centric perspective. Um, and so those are, there are also instances where we might have question marks in terms of right. how, how applicable is it. And in some cases, our notes reflect, and eh, this, this is a little, this is a slightly alternative interpretation or, you know, right. slightly, this is, this is the way we want to be more clear in describing how our data centric view manifests itself in the rating of these, of these categories, because in some cases it's not intuitively obvious and we wanted to make sure what our decision was in right. selecting a potential interpretation plus we also found that since our meetings were once every maybe once or once every two weeks we had to we put questions marks if we started thinking now we have we been consistent here you know we're, are we are we continuing to follow the same logic that we had before uh so that's part of what's there. But what we thought we could do, oh, more questions, but what I thought we, we could do is to maybe, you know, go through the last category here that we have, advise and enable, and just do it in the group and see, <laughs> see what you, what you all think. Because it's, an, as I say, it's an interesting process. It's an interesting way of thinking about uh, data skills too, and competencies too, not only for, you know, ourselves and for our teammates, but for, creating educational resources as well. I mean, what what the, the kind of the landscape is um, for, and, and, and is needed. And that would also help us finish the uh, process. As you can yeah, see, we still yeah, have some go, empty, empty rows in the spreadsheet, uh, which we probably need to make larger as I'm looking at it from yeah, the back. Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> so, yes, go um, yeah, we go. it is a Google Sheet that um, Everybody can comment on, but okay. So I'm at 150. Is that how's that? Should I do? I can do 200. Okay. The oh, so if you select the column B and make the font bigger. Okay. I sure wish I knew. Oh, you have to go into edit mode instead of comment only. Okay, the Mac person needs to needs to come up here and do this. Because <laughs> I couldn't I'll even figure out how to show a <laughs> Google presentation two hours ago. <laughs> that person. Oh, we have to sign in. Ugh. Sign in to Google. To Google. Do you remember your credentials off the top of your head? Um, it's anyone, anyone with the link can can comment. Can comment. That includes you. But we can't, but we can't change the font size. Oh. Do it try two hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did everybody hear that? So you can also, if you go to the go to meeting, you can open the, sl the slides from there. No, I just want to get out. <laughs> I don't want to log in as any of these. Maybe if I just fail. How about escape? Drop down. No, we're yeah. trying to get back to the. We're just trying to get the heck out of get here. To the original. Yeah, escape no, is not it has escaped. Yeah, Is this another instance where the controls have disappeared? Yes. Aha. And now you can go back. Now we can go back. There we go. All right. <laughs> Two 
and go to our correct tab. Scroll down to the blue one. Advise and enable. Oops, sorry. Oh, that means we're not going to be able to fill in the blanks either. While you talk through this, I'm going to get logged in and I can, okay. I can, sh All right. we can do something. I forgot about that part. Here. Right. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's give it a try here. So the area of a responsibility that I, as a, as a research object, am concerned about is being advised and enabled. Uh, and to, to be led by good practice, lead good practice by example. So uh, the task is to, the competency is engaging with research users and stakeholders. What is going on here? Go away. My stages. What is the problem now? I'm trying to get up here so you can see them. There we go. Good. Do I, am I most, am I, what about plan? Is that something that happens during the plan stage? Hmm. When I'm, in, when I'm advising and enabling. I'm, I don't know if the answer, I don't know the answer, but Think of it that way, don't forget. Okay, so that, that was a vote for that one. Any comment on that? It seems to me it would not be part of plan because by that by the time you're engaging, you've, you've, you're past the plan stage. If you wanna have a collaborative system, having multiple stakeholders at the table would help ensure a better database, wouldn't it? I don't know the answer. I just let it. Well, that's why I suggested that, yes, engaging research users and stakeholders is a part of the planning stage of mm -hmm. the life cycle. Okay. No, no objection? All right. How about during the collect stage? Collecting data to do your project to, to, to be created as a resource object to work with others. Eh. No, 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 no. Bar. Doesn't seem like it. Yeah. Okay. A sure stage. During, now, one, one thing to keep in mind, uh, I, I mean, again, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you, but it's, it's, we found it really useful. I guess I really want to use a mouse here um, to keep in mind these other other stages. So just to look a little bit more closely at the at the areas, the, the scope and resource is the, is the top of the. Oops, is that the top of the line? No, sorry, the top of the line of the areas of responsibility is plan and design. These aren't necessarily sequential, but they are delineated. So plan and design is one, capture and process, integrate and analyze, appraise and preserve. What is that one? Present. Let's just go on and see what it says. Preserve, uh, publish and release, expose and discover, uh, scope and resource, and then advise and enable. Does that change anything? Was there an online comment? I don't know. Who said that? I said that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a comment? I, I'm not looking at that Daniel part. would suggest that plan and collect are actually an agile process. Plan and collect are an agile. Oh, so it's iterative. It's a cyclical process. OK. Well, I think, I mean, I think that this is an interesting way to also learn more about the life cycle perspective as well, I think. Um, 
So I think, I mean, and, and I, I've, I, what I know about the life cycle approach is that, you know, if we looked at their arrows that make the circle and make it go around and round, so it's not necessarily a sequ sequential process at all. It could definitely be iterative. So I think that that does make sense that it would be um, that kind of process. What does that mean for this category, though? Was it Daniel or Patrick? Who said that? I'm so, on, online. Does that person have a comment given that? So it, engaging the research users and stakeholders under the advise and enable, I would suggest as an agile process uh, because that, uh, at least within these first two plan and collect of data because it's you're not going to see how the users and the users and stakeholders are not going to actually know how they want to use it uh, until they get to at least play with the data a little mm -hmm. bit uh-huh so so that every that experiment when you plan you've forgotten something and uh, so so do, do you think that means it's part it, it would be important to in, to, to analyze, to be use the analyze process. Uh, sorry, analyze stage first. That that would should be part of that process. Uh, the, I would say the 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 uh, the, the plan and collect. Uh, I, the, the analyze seems like it's very far down the, the down the yeah. line, but the plan and collect uh, at least allows the uh the group of the community to start uh, to, uh, to give feedback of what what is actually mm -hmm. missing yeah so there's the planning stage and everyone uh, uh, contributes there but when you collect that's when you th it's when you're collecting things is when you start noticing what is actually missing okay so so rather than I'll rather than Excuse me, rather than assure. Correct. Okay. Any comments or thoughts about that? Makes sense to me. It sounds like there's a, uh, a book, uh, an upvote for collect. Mm -hmm. We'll see. We'll see how many upvotes we have by the time we get. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so that means uh, not, and again, I have to keep going back, advise and enable. So enable, uh, does that affect Assure in terms of engagement? Uh, you need to let people know that assurance has happened, that, that quality checks have happened. And so that's a communication process uh but does that and that should should probably show up does that show up and describe as well is that how you would let people know that is that how would you engage would you ever crowdsource, would you ever crowdsource your quality would you engage your stakeholders to do quality assurance would you ever do that well yeah i would think i mean like citizen science type stuff well even i mean i think of it from a journal perspective but if there's a oh, something sure. errata some kind of review yeah panel process yeah. yeah so with that so that that would argue for a sure right okay i heard three <laughs> yeah any other comment we can always go backwards too Let's move on to describe, to advise and enable, and engage with researchers and stakeholders. Is, is, that, is engaging with researchers and research users and stakeholders involved in the description process? Seems less important there. It's already done at the advise and enable stage. Unless 
the way in which you describe it or the format in which you describe it needs feedback from mm. research users and stakeholders to determine or change. Right. That, so that, that would be like an annotation or a, um, from, from a research, from an education point of view, somebody talking about fitness for, for use or fitness for purpose, for instance. Or it could be appropriate representation model for different audiences, different stakeholders. So that might, that might, would that be a plus? But I would hope that would have been figured out at the planning stage. Right. <laughs> right. True. One of the other things we found ourselves doing is defaulting to three. We only get three across here. Highest impact. Plus, so. No, I meant, I meant, I'm sorry, three, three of the stages. If we got to four stages and we started going, ah. so anyway, that's where the impact question came in, but we can come back to that too. So does that argue? So that means, what do people think? Should we, I, it seems to me that it should already be done. I guess I would argue for less of an impact there. looking ahead, which is maybe not what you're looking for. No, um, no, no, that's fine. I would say the stage that I would pick out as the most important for engaging with research users and stakeholders would be during the discover stage um, that this. you are, that you need to help, like that's the stage when you wanna be engaging with your mm, users. I see what you're, you're saying. looking mm -hmm. for people to discover your data. Uh-huh. You can skip ahead. Yep, that, I mean, that makes sense to me, other people. I see, I see faces going, hmm. It seems, uh, that makes sense to me and to not, not include it in a description because again, at the engagement stage, it should already have been described. I, I as a research object, should already have been dis described. The, the idea that discover is the most important is a good one assuming the data are good in the first place. Uh -huh. That is to say that you chose the right thing to observe and the right variables to measure and the right mm. content to collect such that it can be discovered and used. Um, but mm. that argues that perhaps the planning and collecting is more important to make sure that by the time you get to discover, you actually yeah. have something that people can yeah. use. Mm hmm So maybe, uh, I mean, one thing we could do is say, I, I guess what that means, that sounds like it, it, th there's more of an implication of sequence in this one than there, than there are with some of the others in terms of the, the competency, that you don't engage with the research users and the stakeholders until as you just said, uh, so so discover would be farther down the path of that sequence of activities and less of an impact. So if we were to focus on our top three, well, let's let's put it let's put plus uh, at least one plus and plus and discover, and then. Um, if somebody can keep track of what I what the, the question, the, the part about the sequence, I'll try to remember that that issue. I actually added to the notes. Oh yay! At least the plan and collect are required before discovery is important. Yep. Yep. Um, it's just that we don't have the comments displayed. Right. There. Right. Okay. So uh, and then that we'll have to come back then to describe probably at that point once once we figure out what to do to discover. Uh, although I guess we decided not to include that. So I, that's what the zero means. You're, you're saying it was not included. I'm not sure what you're, there's a zero in describe. That one didn't seem to have okay. a strong. That's what I thought. So it's essentially not. Okay, yeah. I just was trying to interpret. Your, <laughs> we're kind of making this up as we go along. Can you tell? <laughs> right. Okay. The sign for down there we go. So preserve. 
seems like less less of an issue at that at, at that point. Yes, I hear no. Oh, I hear agreement. I think with it, I hear agreement. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, and, the, and then integrate and analyze. Again, advise and enable engaging stakeholders. Seems like those are, what do, what do people think about that? Things like those are less important to given the others. Right. Well, and, and have some assurance. Yes, no. <laughs> What you you need to have made sure that you can integrate the data that you have enough right. information in your collection in your representation in your planning such that it can be integrated right but at that point you've done all your stakeholder engagement long yeah long before yeah yeah so I think I think those I would agree that those two are not as impactful so that means we've got the highest are actually plan, collect, and assure, sounds like. Yeah? OK. Well, we can do a, a couple more of these. Developing a profile of open research. In You're order now potentially starting to gain an understanding of how it has taken us two months of <laughs> semi-weekly meetings <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to right. get as far as we have in this process. <laughs> Did, yeah. So you had use cases for data one that, because it defining what you mean by data becomes really important. And it's, you know, a wall cam is not data until you apply it to use it. So if you have a use case, some of it might be you want to find out if somebody has ever planned how to do this, even though they didn't have the funding, and suddenly it becomes really urgent. I mean, I can make an argument for all sorts of stages that involve context. Mm -hmm. And all of these seem to be really context dependent on what, what made it data in this case and when it was just noise that you tried to get rid of. So preservation for us has been lossy versus non-lossy compressions. And there are a bunch of things where, yeah, we thought we weren't losing anything valuable, but then we realized later. And that's where it takes a lot of effort to try to figure out how many contexts of use there might be that would consider this number or this observation or this instrument or this mission <laughs> to be relevant to their uh, proof or disproof of an assertion. I don't know. Right, but, but, the, but the way of determining, mean, getting it back to what we're trying to determine or, or what uh, the competencies would be for in some ways, almost any of those situations uh, is is part of what we're looking at. So, I mean, it, it's I don't know about what the use cases were in the development of of data one. Right, and I was going to say that while I wasn't um, directly a part of the data one lifecycle model development, which is I think essentially what you're referring to in terms of these particular steps in the life cycle. Um, Data One, its primary focus was based on a general collection of use cases around the scientific uses of, of environmental um, environmental data, and so as that was the sort of the, the disciplinary uh, or domain focus of the Data One project. So there is a bit of a bias mm -hmm. in the conceptualization of the life cycle towards observational data um, and uh, and 
implications of that in terms of yeah you know, these questions about um, the assurance and um, you know particular collection approaches that may not necessarily apply in other scenarios where you may have passive data collection, you may have post hoc data uh, acquisition from un, sort of unplanned sources. Um, in this case, this is, and I think it's based more on an engineered designed data data collection process. I'm not sure that's exactly answering your question, but um, there is an environmental uh, data focus that was a driver for the data one uh, life cycle. But I, you know, I think I think one of the things we also do as we're working on this is to just bring our own perspective, our knowledge, our, our knowledge experience, back to it. So, I mean, when when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking of it kind of from a repository point of view too. My, you know, me as a research object in a repository. So, I, I you know I I think of that. I bring that perspective. In 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 in, in a way, it's a use case, but it's it's also you know a way of providing context to the different stages too that that uh, can be useful to expected I, I'm sorry what do you mean by expected use well um, for it to be data there was an expectation that it was going to be used in some scientific yes yeah, oh, and you're talking about an the expected loss. use, and then there gets to be a, a reuse issues. Right. And, and yes. we're trying to do uh, convergence, right? Right. So we're trying to reuse data in new contexts. And if right. you're trying to do that, then some of these get much more interesting to me, and you get a different strategy for allocating resources to things like preserving it so that it's really tagged in such a way that it makes it easy for somebody to discover it when they're not in the original context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think I agree, uh, and but all of that should be happening, I hope, in the planning stage, because by the time it gets to a repository, it's generally already too late to do a lot of that work for later reuse. Um, well, unless part of what the repository does is is to provide services to, you know, make that make it more reusable, reusable later on, or do the the changing it to formats that meet the repository for preservation purposes. Blah 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 blah. So um, yes, but. Um, it's always better to get that information built in from the beginning. Cheaper. <laughs> well, and more likely correct. Right, right. Yeah, and again, from the competency point of view, uh, a person, I mean, this is bringing in what Danny was talking about in terms of who's doing what, but uh, somebody who's, whose skill set involves knowing more about what needs to be done for preservation in an environment where their organization values that is going to need to have a different, uh, uh, maybe not a different skill, uh, different skills possibly than somebody in a, in a different environment or an institutional repository, for instance, something like that. Um, so yeah, that those are the kinds of nuances that you'd have to, you, you as, uh, as a person, who wants to learn skills would have to, you know, know know what you're getting into, or, you know, that's when you would add on to the skills if you're in an environment that you need that and don't have it. For instance, that's part of the trying to establish the, you know, the the framework of skills, the core set of skills. It would seem so. So we've got about a half an hour left, um, and we could potentially try to wade our way through. Yeah, I don't. I mean, we don't. Additional line, but we may be reaching a point of diminishing returns in terms of this particular exercise. But I, I think we have succeeded in uh, at least providing a context that we're working in and trying to address this. But um, in our remaining time, um, it may be worthwhile for us to. Um, 
enter into the higher level conversation in terms of our, our discussion around number one, the potential usability of these approaches, what strategies we would uh, potentially want to use moving forward, mm -hmm. especially back to Danny's question about being able to integrate as we're coming in, we're sort of building the bridge from both ends at this point with this, um, this life cycle perspective and uh, this uh, persona based perspective what are some strategies we can use to try to converge these approaches um, to ultimately provide a more uh, comprehensive understanding of the needed competencies for the various uh, uh, members of our community, whether they are um, the researchers, the data librarians that may be supporting those researchers, the folks that are working in our facilities that are designing and supporting the infrastructure that is being used for um, data discovery, access, and preservation. Um, so, you want to go to the survey? Um, so, well, the, in this case, this this survey that we have here takes us back to that persona-based uh, approach. This one, which, um, right? Yeah. Um, and so, this is where. Um, Part of, part of our goal here is to engage you in providing some of this feedback in a slightly more simplified <laughs> frame than the one we were just going through, but we wanted to give you a, a flavor of that work, in, that work in progress that's going on right now. Um, but also we wanted to uh, start on providing a, and, and having a conversation around these um, this competencies cap, uh, approach um, with a slightly different focus. And if, for the, any of you that might have participated in the summer um, poster response process, um, as Nancy described, we had the um, essentially not applicable and then levels of importance in terms of minimal. Oops. Um, I hear it, it's fluent. <laughs> We're doing. Well, we had importance levels oh, okay, where sorry. as we have uh, you know, given more thought to how to characterize competency, um, it may be more a matter of is that competency important, more or less important, or are degrees of competency a more useful way of thinking about um, the collection of skills that a particular participant in the data management curation process uh, needing to be. So in this case, we've adopted a novice, competent, and fluent terminology, um, thinking about a base level of familiarity of, of basic concepts, potentially being the novice level. You're, you're not, you know, it's not a totally foreign concept to you. And that level of basic familiarity is, is needed for that particular competency. Competent means that you are actually functional uh, in that particular competency area. Um, but you may still um, need some uh, periodic supporting information. Uh, you may need to uh, you know, talk to others sometimes when questions arise. Mm. Um, you haven't reached that, um, that level of you know, whether it's expert or, uh, or really being able to just, you know, uh, based on your, your body of experience, being able to pretty much handle the bulk of the which is tasks the, that come across your desk. Which is the fluency, fluency is, category, yeah. Then, yeah, fluency is that state where- The expert, essentially. Yeah, you're, you're the expert and you're able to um, work within that particular competency with great comfort and, and ease. You know, I think about it in terms of, you know, my, my fluency in writing Python and Jupyter Notebooks, where I, I would place myself in the competent category as I find myself regularly, I, I write functional code and I can, with, the, with my ability to uh, effectively do searches and find uh, potential solutions in Stack Exchange, integrate them very quickly even for problems that I haven't yet encountered, I can very quickly um, address those problems 
through a combination of existing experience and um, ability to find the resources I need to integrate that information very quickly. So, so this survey is intended, we're asking you if you have the time and interest to go and, and fill out the survey for us. What we've got are, it's, it's divided into um, the competencies for data advisors, from a data advisor's point of view, again, that persona and, you know, again, the explanations of different tasks and so on are there to give you more of a context and then data, uh, data service providers. So is there another question? One of our online participants, um, Daniel Puka, wants uh -huh. to know, did Hi, Daniel. <laughs> he miss a topic of cross-scientific domain experience because mm. that would greatly affect the reuse? Okay, sounds good. We should, can we, we collect those comments too, right? Can you add, we, we'll we should make add sure that. you get them. Uh, okay, good, that. yeah, because that that's, yeah, one of the things we did with the interactive poster actually uh, was to ask people what, what was missing and we got some good comments there too. So this is useful again, thank you, Daniel. Uh, well, the other things I, I wanted to mention too, in terms of our reasons for showing that, you know, the, the complex process <laughs> uh, that we just went through was to see if anybody's interested in joining. Coming to, coming to the party, we have a, a little bit, a uh, few more, uh, as you saw, a few more columns and, and or, or sorry, rows to go through. Uh, the other thing that is the context for this, I didn't mention too, and uh, uh, is that the EOSC folks are also in the process of using these same competencies uh, and um, trying to, uh, to develop terms that, the community can agree upon for uh, the competencies, associated competencies in these different categories in order to build an ontology that can be reused around uh, around the world for developing that data, that data skills framework. So uh, Danny, that's the terms for skills work that uh, this also relates to. So it, I think with our feedback, the feedback we're planning to give to this group, and I, I'm involved in it, in that terms for skills, uh, ontology development as well, but there's an opportunity for us to give the earth science perspective uh, to, which I think would be really helpful for, I hope they would appreciate, I'm sure they would actually. And um, they, they looked at Angus White, the author, uh, talked with us about what we're doing at the Clearinghouse too, because they're also talking about building a registry. Uh, but but get that that's more context for what we're trying to do, what we're why we're doing this as well. But um, any if you're interested in it, we'd really appreciate getting your your uh, comments on on this survey, answering the survey for both the advisors and the service providers' points of view. Yeah, the link is in the slides. Yeah. Oh, you mean so, so people see it now? Yeah. Okay. So now I have to go find how how to do that again. Ah, definitely. Let's see. There, here, and it's the middle one. No, nope. that's that one. And here's the slide. And here's the link. So it's a sir. Can you see that at all? Survey monkey. Survey monkey. Slash R. Horrible way to do this, sorry. Oh, chat. Oh, that's a good idea. Alexis, is that possible? Can you? Alexis is going to do it. Hooray. Thank God for community fellows. <laughs> it's an interesting process to really try to differentiate and think through, so I'd really appreciate your. Uh, definitely share it. Room and share. Yes, please. Yeah. No, the more the merrier. We got a lot of response on the uh, the interactive poster, so it'd be nice to really, not that we have numbers. Well, I guess we have a number of dots, so that's helpful. But <laughs> yeah, because we, we want to, again, provide feedback. This is the sort of feedback we want to provide to the EOSC folks as well, and then, and then all fold it into the Career Compass. Just was EOS the somebody presented at uh, the was it Data Week in Botswana on a matrix of training to, and the quadrants were I know you were there and I'm not giving you enough context it looks like by the mm. look on your face well depends anyway, so, I'm waiting um, 
uh, I want to say she was from the UK. And oh, you're thinking was, Laura Malloy? Laura yes, Malloy. Yes, Laura yeah, Malloy. But, she had sort of a, a matrix divided in quadrants by uh, role. Right. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Can yes. Can you um, comment on like the evolution of that or uh, the relationship between any of that and EOS or there well, is nothing? Well, Laura is part of the part of the terms for skills and you're providing feedback on it. And so she, yeah, in, in some ways they, that, I mean, that looks like a very useful uh, way to look at things. It's a little dated now in, because it's a, it's about four or five, six, seven years old. And so I think some of the other thing that I think um, the perspective that was presented in that did not include uh, the perspective that EOS does, which in, includes research scientists and data scientists. So, so they've got a perspective. Uh, what's it, useful in that report is a perspective of a broader team of people who are involved in data management. Yes. So one of the things that's really useful about this report, too, and, and this tables that we point you to, is that uh, as they give you the idea of competencies and skills that you need in summaries, there's also a, a, a categories for who do you go to help with this? Where can you find ta training on this? What, who who yes. in, uh, else in the research team do you engage with in order to further your skills? So I guess that was my question. Like, the, So the, the other shoe that drops from this effort is, is the intent to have, and you might have said this from the start and I missed it, intent to, will, so say you determine I need these skills or these high frequency competencies is there an intent to kind of connect that to where I can find that in the clearinghouse? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. as a repository director or manager, I say, oh, well, we have stewards that need these competencies and my team seems to be lacking here. I can go into the clearinghouse and have everybody come up to speed or, well, find, or at fi least yeah. Yeah, find resources. Find right? resources. I mean, the, the, the limitation to what we can do in the clearinghouse at this point is that we are gathering these things and we're not necessarily getting them from the creators themselves. So it's to the extent that we can determine how a given resource would meet that requirement, you know, we will, we can provide that, but it's, that's why one of the reasons that we're going into, you know, that's how, that's the link to the assessment work we're trying to do with the, with the uh, grant because Part of what we want to do is provide the mechanism for people to comment on a resource to say, yes, it met my needs uh, for this purpose, or yes, it really fit this target audience, or no, it didn't, you need to, uh, 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 whatever it is. You know, we're not sure how we're going to do that yet, and it may not be quite that, you know, talky. It might be more kind of grid-like to start with. But, but yeah, that's the connection is to be able to, you know, provide some context from, from a, a teacher a teacher, a creator point of view, an adapter, teacher adapter point of view, and from a user, student point of view. So yeah, that's. And that's, and the other thing that I might add is that um, as uh, as Nancy mentioned, um, you know this uh, the our related activity on enhancing the clearinghouse, in addition to the assessment component that we've really highlighted here, um, another component of that that we've already. Uh, we've already at least at because uh, we're having to actually rebuild the clearinghouse from the ground up because of the underlying technical issues, but we've identified a set of metadata enhancements, um, extending the metadata model that we are current, that is used in the current clearinghouse to add additional metadata components to facilitate additional uh, search use cases mm -hmm. and discovery use cases for the clearinghouse. Um, and the question that you're asking in terms of being able to discover content to the clearinghouse in terms of training materials, there's a current alignment with life si a variety of life cycles, life Fra cycle frameworks. 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 Mm -hmm. um, and being able to potentially align them with a set of standardized competencies is a very logical complement to that. Um, in our first iteration of the enhancement of our metadata model, we haven't integrated that specific element, but I think that that would be a near-term uh, next iteration on, on our metadata model enhancement, giving, given the insights that we're gaining through mm -hmm. the conversation around this competencies approach. Yep. Okay.
Any more comments or thoughts? Have uh, have other have people have found other uh, frameworks that are that have been useful for data skills development at any kind of I don't know if people are connected to the iSchools, the, the people who are teaching data management skills, or to data scientists. Do you have any uh, 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 curricula for data scientists that could inform this or work as well? I spent some time with Robert Wolf uh, trying to talk about maturity models, mm. and that's in coding. Um, I think that similar approach would mm. fit what you're doing pretty well. In terms of, uh, could you talk about that a little bit more? It's the maturity of the of the of the the skill sets that people have, or of it, it's. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry. How would you apply it? Is I guess is what I'm asking. Maturity model. I know it can be related to data sets and yeah, the, that the kind context of becomes important. You're you're developing software to process some of the data. Uh -huh. Well, you analyze the software's maturity based uh, on a number mm -hmm. of criteria. Well, mm -hmm. similar to software that has a capability you want a data advisor yeah, yeah, yeah. to know about that software right. maturity but to also know about probably the fair maturity how, right, right. how okay. well has this data set met certain criteria mm -hmm. for uh, the things fair considers and probably some other things that are more context dependent to the potential use or the potential reuse of right, the right. data set. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things we, one of the frameworks that is in the clearinghouse at the moment is the, is the fair, are the fair principles. But again, it's because we're you know, looking from the outside quite often in terms of the metadata, sort of a typical metadata problem. The person who knows the most about it is the creator and they're the one least interested in talking about it because they've done the darn thing. Why would they want to talk about it? Why would they want to provide metadata? But we do the best we can and then that that's where the, re the assessment comes in. But yeah, 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 makes sense. That's, thank you, that's a good point. Anybody else? Survey. Yep. Other than that, I think we can answer any questions that might come up during that process. Yep. We've got about 15 minutes before the end of the session, and we for, then have a, a break, and then yeah. yeah. For coffee. Coffee break. Cookies. No, 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 Who cares break. about coffee? <laughs> Oh gosh, we don't have a deadline for this uh, AGI thing yet, but <laughs> but we probably for a couple months. I mean, it, your comment about sharing, Danny, makes me think we should definitely send this out to ESEP all, at least if not other communities. So yeah, thank you. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But all of the survey results are rolling into a single collection of results. Right. So we can look at what we heard from our particular, you know, our group at this event, but we can roll that into a collection of responses from folks that are responding to the same survey. We don't have a tight uh, mailing list, do we? We only have a piece of all and then the community communities and all things and things like that. But there's no way. Like, it would be great to send this all the same one. Oh. Yeah. No, we don't. I mean, we could. It's a good idea. We could also identify who the type ones are, and then right. figure it from there. That's it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And it would also give us a sense of demographics too that would yeah. be useful because yeah. we which we don't necessarily have right now 
Good idea. I knew I needed paper for some reason. That's true. If you say it into the microphone. <laughs> oh. She said type one alias, type one lists. Send it to type one lists. And then Howard said uh, maturity, maturity model. model. For data handling, it sounded like. Data management. Data management advisement, advisors, and stewards. Nancy, for us newbies, what is a type one? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Type uh, the um, data, data repositories. Data repositories. Yeah. 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 Yes, and I was chair of partnership, and yeah, I had to go now. Which one is type one? <laughs> I want to go the other way around. I want to make fives ones, and it doesn't work. Fives are the no fours are the NASA NASA NOAAs, the sponsors. Yeah. Thank you. You said you're at ESIP in the summer. I was not. I think um, some of NCEI's archive branch people were there. Have you talked to the people at NCEI who had to cope with this as part of the consolidation efforts of three different data centers? Uh, not about the not about the this particular survey. How so? How? Right. And providing some feedback that there was not, we didn't collect associated demographic information or affiliation information, so we wouldn't be able to identify. It, it was at the reception, so people had glasses of wine and were putting stickers up, so we didn't necessarily identify who they were. But if there are people we should talk to about it. Yeah, I'm going to throw my boss right under the bus. Okay. I'm sure that. <laughs> I'm sure that'll do well. Um, I would suggest that you contact Nancy Ritchie, mm -hmm. who is branch chief of the data stewardship division of NCEI, yeah, the archive branch. Okay. She's a good starting point. Um, there are other uh, branch chiefs I would suggest talking to, who, um, including Rich Baldwin with the, I'm picking out the bosses because some of these questions in terms of another one would be Ross Parsons, who's, um, I can't remember his title, but he's up there at um, NCEI, because the terminology is different that I see in your headings, but have had to face a lot of the questions you're asking in your survey. Mm. And while I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, oh, we just went through this three years ago <laughs> while they were defining roles, oh, jobs, is that right? oh, and whatnot. Okay. The terms are different, but essentially a lot of the roles you have in CEI has broken down the, the to deal way. with our particular uh -huh. issues with data and also the project data. So. Yeah, I I would think, um, but I will send the survey along to Nancy directly. Okay, that'd be but you great. can tell her that her staff was here and just threw okay. her right up okay. there. Right? Okay. Yeah. So did, was there a report that was issued that kind of gave, or, or the show did it show up? I, I suspect on a professional level, mm. um, and she's very good about responding, but she's just the start. I'd also talk no, to I, Yeah, I know her, so I, easy. I didn't realize that that was happening, so I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, they would have had to have gone through this at least over a four-year process in order to consolidate three different data centers uh. with a widely different group of data, automated data, one-off data. Um, but as far as developing a set of core competencies for a given staff position, which is what, how I'm translating oh, all right. of this. Yeah. Um, they would have had to take that account partly while staff were being slotted in as part yeah. of the consolidation effort, partly developing job descriptions sure, for new sure. staff. So yeah, there, there's other people who have walked through this fire. Okay, great, <laughs> thank you.
That's helpful. Yeah, one of the things we're planning to do actually as part of, and we are starting to do as part of this uh, small group work is collect job descriptions and see how you know the J the job descriptions translate to this kind of competencies too. So. Why don't you from what, again, from what I'm seeing, they're similar terms, but the functions are, are there already uh -huh, okay. in the way that we decided to do it, or yeah. I didn't decide to do it. The bosses decided to do it at NCEI. I would probably yeah. be a better way of doing okay. it. Okay. But yeah, this looks very familiar in a way. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. So unless there's anything else, I think we may be done. Yeah, we'll just, we can certainly hang out here while you finish the surveys. <laughs> Feel free to, <laughs> Thank here's you some candy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention and your contributions. Yeah.